Welcome to the top 10 tips to design your home like a pro. I'm Anna Hackathorn and I'm excited to help you with your interior design project. I love giving clients the tools to transform their spaces and see their amazing before and after photos. I've been in hundreds of homes for design consultations and I meet people facing the same challenges time and time again. Some of these might apply to you without you even being aware of it. Oftentimes, we don't know what we don't know. I'm going to teach you several secrets for how to overcome these design obstacles with confidence and elevate your lifestyle. The design process is similar to completing a large puzzle. In the beginning, you have an overwhelming mass of seemingly unrelated pieces, but then you develop a framework, fill in the pieces with each decision building on the last and making it that much easier for you to take one step further. Let's first take a quick look at the titles on the list. Number one, get started. What to do and what to avoid. Number two, make a complete plan. Develop a realistic framework to follow before buying or painting anything. Number three, gather enough information. It's worth it to do your homework. Number four, learn what the rules are and are not so you can learn to trust yourself and your decisions. Number five, identify what you like by selecting, reviewing, and comparing inspirational photos of rooms. Number six, look at samples properly. Gather all proposed materials together before buying or painting anything. Number seven, edit well. Evaluate what you already own and determine how it can fit into the ideal design you're creating. Number eight, balance, scale, and proportion. Learn how to buy the right amounts of items in the right sizes. Number nine, learn how to properly place art. Be confident in choosing pieces that elevate your design plan. And number 10, complete your project. Layering and styling tips to finish a room. I'll discuss each item on the list today, and if you'd like even more detailed information on all of these, plus many more items, I created a series of step-by-step -step video lessons that will help you to overcome the guesswork and learn how to design beautiful and unique rooms. It includes dozens of downloadable planning lists, diagrams, example layouts, a vendor resource list, color palettes, and various tools that are all available on our website, so be sure to take a look at the course content tab on our homepage for a complete list. Number one, get started. This may be controversial, but I'm here to tell you that you should not worry about trying to define your design style in words. Why? I find that not only can it slow down your process at the beginning if you're trying to sort through the wide variety of definitions out there, but it may also limit you in purchasing items that you're actually drawn to. I see many people get stuck with trying to label their design style and taking endless online quizzes about it. It's actually not a necessary step to take and finding one or several inspirational photos that speak to you is far more helpful than forcing a name on your style that can mean different things to different people in this industry. You probably want your home to look better, but have a hard time taking the first step, either because you think you don't have enough time, enough money, enough knowledge, or you're afraid of making mistakes. It's easy to get distracted and procrastinate these days as our lives are balancing acts and we are bombarded with information. At some point, you need to stop the endless searching for ideas and going down rabbit holes of articles, hoping for an epiphany and just dig in here and get your hands dirty. Designing a home can be complicated and time consuming and if you find yourself lost in the process, you are not alone. I know it can be intimidating to look at a beautiful photo of a room and think, I'd love to live in a home that looks like this, but there's no way I can achieve that. Well, I want you to know that this may not be as glamorous of a business as you expect. It's a lot of problem solving and list making. Most magazine and Instagram photo shoots don't just happen. It takes time and effort for interior designers to make rooms look so timeless and effortless. So prepare yourself to invest some time and effort, but in the long run, it's better than living indefinitely in a place that's not satisfying. Spending time on your home now will be worth the gratification that will follow instead of looking back years later at all the empty spots with no changes and wishing you hadn't been living like this for so long. 
I've seen that happen to people so many times. A long time ago, I heard some very good advice in a seminar, which was don't compare your beginning to someone else's middle. And I hope that's good motivation to help get you started. Number two, make a complete plan. The best way to get started is to develop a realistic framework to follow before buying or painting anything. If you're planning to complete a project in phases, you don't need all the financial resources at once. But if you take the time to create a detailed overall plan and budget at the beginning, it may save you time and money in the long run. So hone in on your favorite inspiration photos, measure your space, make a written list of every single thing that you need to eventually finish your project whether you're going to buy in the next week or the next year, or if it's in your five-year plan. Determine an overall design direction and allocate at least a rough cost for each item, down to the art and accessories. I like to break down the process of interior design into one that a lot of regular people can relate to because most of you probably learned a version of this in grade school. It's like completing a research paper or creative writing assignment. Step one is brainstorming and gathering notes. Step two is preparing an outline. Step three is moving to a rough draft, maybe several versions of a rough draft, before reaching step four, the final draft stage. When learning this, many younger kids wanna skip steps and just start off writing the final draft. The outcome ends up being a rambling mess until they reach an age where they learn the process is essential to the final product. I see a lot of adults struggling with designing their homes because they start by going to a store and buying stuff for the final draft without going through the first three planning steps. They may go through a few rounds of that, sometimes over the course of many months or even years. They end up with many things that don't work, regret their choices, then don't trust themselves to buy the rest of what they need. This results in a home that chronically feels unfinished, full of pieces that were purchased as band-aids rather than as intentional building blocks with an overall end goal in mind. This might seem counterintuitive, but making many decisions together can actually make each individual decision less difficult. When you're looking at all the possible elements in a room at once, it can be easier to see what choices work and don't work in the bigger picture, and it helps to narrow them down. For example, if you focus too much on just one element alone, like a paint color, you don't yet have enough information to work with, so it may feel like a big guessing game and it can be hard to see the forest through the trees. But if you go through the steps of deciding on a rug color, a sofa color, some wood colors, and a paint color all at the same time, you can use a process of elimination for each item if you consider whether or not it will work with all the other items in the room. Another important thing to understand is how to look at what needs to happen on a wall, and this is a crucial step of the planning process. In design, we call the drawing version of this an elevation. It shows the height of everything from the floor to the ceiling. In a great room design, you not only need to decide what furniture fits well on the floor, you need tall enough things to properly fill up the wall space and to draw your eyes up to make the ceiling appear higher. This includes placing art well along with window treatments, lamps, plants, and the right heights of furniture. Even if you aren't taking the step of creating an actual drawing, planning what goes into each elevation in your room is essential before you start buying new items. Again, you don't have to buy everything at once. There's a quote from Winston Churchill that I love, which is, he who fails to plan is planning to fail. And I think it's so fitting here. Number three, gather enough information. I strongly believe that knowledge is power. Take the time to thoroughly research all the details of what's involved in each option you're considering so you know what you're really working with. I see so many people live with stress about a design choice they need to make, sometimes for months, which is understandable because if you make a mistake in interior design, it can be expensive to fix and no one wants to waste money doing something twice or living with an eyesore they can't afford to fix. 
but oftentimes the cost or time or the steps involved in a decision are drastically larger or smaller than what someone is imagining in their head before doing their actual homework. Quite often, by crossing the investigation part of it off your list, you can make it much easier on yourself to make an educated decision and move forward, and sometimes the choice might naturally be made for you. Clients who are new to the high-end interior design process are often amazed at how many design compromises are made based on logistical and financial issues, even for people with bigger budgets. For example, let's say you're considering whether or not to remove a wall so you can open up your kitchen and join it with your family room. Don't spend months agonizing about which is better or designing all of it in your head before talking to a contractor about what it will take to remove that wall. There are so many variables that could affect the cost and time associated with that. It could be fairly easy or it could be way too expensive of a headache if it's a load-bearing wall and includes moving HVAC equipment, electrical, and plumbing elements. Or let's say you're debating between refinishing an existing coffee table versus buying a new one. Try not to make an assumption on which option is more expensive and waste time and energy planning around that without actually going through the process of obtaining the quotes you need. Also, many people look for help from a designer because they have a hard time envisioning what a new color or piece of art or a different furniture layout will look like in their home. While this can certainly be a gift that some of us have more than others, there are a lot of tools out there to help you visualize. The ability to take visualization into your own hands can help you to make purchases and decisions with more confidence. In our video series, I'll show you how to find and narrow down inspirational photos, look at colors, measure your space properly, look at furniture layouts and elevations, compare samples for paint and furnishings, organize boards on Pinterest, and create design boards, which are all designed to give you the information you need to make educated choices. Number four, learn what the rules are and are not. Yes, there are design rules, but maybe not as many as you think. In many areas of life, if we break the rules, we don't often get away with a positive outcome. Design is one of those places where it's not only okay to break them, it's often encouraged, and many amazing designers do just that. It's not like a math equation where there's only one right answer. So much of design is just personal preference. It's easier to follow your gut on certain design choices and be successful at doing that if you know what the rules are and why. Here are some classic ones. I talk about rug size often. So many people err on the side of buying them too small, but if you have the right size, it can make your room feel bigger and better. For a seating arrangement, try to have at least the front half of sofas and club chairs on the rug. And if the arrangement isn't pushed up against the wall, try to have all of it sitting completely on the rug. Another good rule is curtain placement. A room feels so much better if a curtain rod is high enough and wide enough, but many people order the wrong size and hang them too low. And I often suggest that people hang light fixtures over a kitchen island or dining table much lower than they think. There's a variation in the industry on this one, but I like them about 24 inches above the surface, maybe 30 inches. So they're closer to the tabletop than to the ceiling. And here's an example of something that's not a rule. You don't have to paint all of the trim and ceilings in your home white. You could paint the trim the same color as the walls, or you could paint a built-in cabinet, a deep, rich color instead of white. Or you could paint your ceiling light blue to mimic the outdoors. Clients often ask for help when they need to make a decision between two options and ask me for the one right answer. Sometimes there is one right answer, as I just discussed. But oftentimes, my honest opinion from a visual standpoint is that either option works equally well. There are two or more schools of thought on many different design topics. Not even interior designers all agree on what the rules are. When I'm doing a consultation, a lot of my job is to discuss the pros and cons of different options 
and provide you with information you may or may not have thought of on your own so that you can make the best educated decisions for yourself when you're shopping. There are a lot of things that designers may understand that people outside the industry might not until they're brought to their attention. For example, a client might ask me, how high should I tell my electrician to put the sconce? And my answer is, put it around eye level because it's meant to light your face well. And the client says, oh yeah, of course that makes sense. A lot of things in design are actually pretty straightforward, but because you may not be used to looking at things from this standpoint, it doesn't seem obvious until after someone points them out. I think it's easy for all of us to assign complexity to areas that don't need them, but we do it because we aren't familiar with that field. I know I do this. When I need computer technicians to fix problems in our office and they point out things I've been doing wrong, it seems so obvious to me in hindsight. I assumed it was more complicated than it was because I didn't know enough about it. So many clients have better design ideas than they think they do. They often just need some validation and guidance. Anyone can make his or her house look better regardless of the budget. I see people make mistakes and then stop their project because they're afraid that there are a lot of rules that they don't understand. Making mistakes and learning from them is part of the process, even for A-list designers. The overall principles of good interior design and the steps it takes to pull together a great room don't change much over time. What does change are current trends and what pieces are available from season to season at retail stores. I'm not a huge fan of just buying what's trendy. My goal is to teach you more about where there are important design rules to follow, what to consider about how different design elements work together, and where there are places you can feel free to do whatever feels best for you. Number five, identify what you like by selecting, reviewing, and comparing inspirational photos of rooms. This is a quick list of some of the individual elements you may like about a room you've seen, but you just haven't known how to break it down so you could recognize them. Take a look at some photos you like, pretend like you're using a magnifying glass, slowly go through each area of the photos, and ask yourself the following questions. See if you notice any common threads. What kinds of colors are used? Are they bright or muted? colorful or neutral? How many different colors are used? Is there a big contrast between darks and lights or not? If patterns are being used, where are they placed? Are they large scale patterns or smaller in scale? How are they mixed? Is there a big mix of textures? What kind of focal point does the room have? How are the individual furnishings relating to each other? And is there a variation in sizes used? What are the things that make a big statement that make you notice them right away? And then what are the things that don't jump out at you and are just quiet pieces that fade into the background? And some of the most important questions to ask are often overlooked, like what kind of art is displayed and how is it placed? And is there a layer of accessories that makes the rooms feel finished? A lot of clients come to me and already have inspirational photos they love, but they have a hard time describing exactly what they like about them. One of the tricky things about interior design for people is that the sum is more than just the total of its parts. So both the small details of individual pieces and the overall feeling of a room are important. In our course, we teach you how to make sure that the different elements of a room work together in harmony. Number six, look at samples properly. Gather all of your proposed materials together before making individual decisions. You may not realize how much colors can change in different settings until you've made an expensive mistake. I strongly suggest going through the planning steps and obtaining samples for everything you're considering, including rugs, fabrics, window treatments, paint colors, wood or metal colors for both furniture as well as existing wood colors in your home, and even down to the art and accessories if you have specific pieces that you know you want to use. A color can look very different in a store or online than it does in your home. There are so many shades and variations of every color. 
For example, you could bring a white paint sample home and discover that it looks really yellow or really gray with the light you have and the existing furniture you have. Sometimes when you bring a blue sofa fabric in to coordinate with an existing rug, you realize that it actually looks much more green than you expected. It's super important to collect samples for as many new potential purchases as you can and look at them all together in the space they'll be placed at various times of the day as the light changes. I recently had a client who ordered some window shades on her own for a few rooms in her house. When she contacted me a few weeks later to help with paint colors, she realized how limited we were in finding colors that worked well around the new shades in addition to her other existing finishes. So she regretted buying them without having more of a plan first. This is another layer of the importance of looking at the bigger picture before buying or painting anything. Number seven, edit well. Evaluate what you already own and determine how it can fit into the ideal design you're creating. Most of you aren't starting completely from scratch with all new furnishings and you'll want to use or will need to use some of your existing pieces. In a perfect world, everything in your home would bring you joy, but in some places you just need a tasteful piece to play a supporting role and work well with the rest. Not every single item needs to be a showstopper. Knowing that can help to take some of the pressure off. On the other hand, sometimes even if you have a piece you like, it may not have a good place in the overall plan you're developing. Ask yourself how much each individual item may or may not contribute to your design vision as a whole. It's important to be open-minded about looking at the best layout for your space and the design and functionality of your older pieces with fresh eyes. If you can include buying new things in your budget, give yourself permission to part with current items that you don't love or that just don't work well in your new master plan, regardless of how long you've had them. You could try to sell them or there are so many places accepting donated furniture and it can really help those who are less fortunate. I mention it here because I find that a lot of people get stuck trying to keep several older items that just don't work well at all in order to buy one big expensive piece that they hope will make everything else kind of disappear. For example, if you have a dining room where you don't like anything about it, so you find an expensive dining table that you plan on using with the rest of your older pieces, it could be worth investigating a less expensive new table option that allows you room in your budget to also replace the chairs and the light fixture with pieces that are more fitting with your ideal style, so the overall design is more cohesive and functional. Also, be honest with yourself and realistic about the way you live and make room for the mess of everyday life. Sometimes editing and managing the inevitable clutter that many of us face is much easier if you invest in organizational tools and have a few good looking but functional and well-placed items such as pretty exposed trays and then hidden closet organizers. As I've discussed earlier, having the right design plan before you start buying things can be a huge help for so many reasons, including helping to decide what items to get rid of and what items to keep, both in the short term and in the long term. Number eight, balance, scale, and proportion. There are three important things to keep in mind. First is that it's important to have a variation in the sizes of furniture you use to add visual interest. You don't wanna buy all large scale pieces or all small scale pieces. So plan to have small, medium, and large pieces within most rooms. Second, plan to have pieces that are the right scale in relation to each other so they don't feel out of proportion. And third, plan for the possibility of needing filler pieces that you may not use for their function, but they're just there to give the room a sense of visual completion and that's okay. I often see people who go out and buy a big sofa or sectional and then run into one of the following problems. They buy other furniture and rugs to go with it that are way too small relative to the giant sofa and or they don't buy enough pieces to go with the giant sofa. It's fairly common that once people see how big the sofa looks, 
They're afraid that buying more big furniture will be too much and will make the room feel smaller. In my experience, the opposite can often be true. In order to make a room feel large, you actually need to use all of it well and have the right sizes and quantities of pieces to really ground the space. That doesn't mean that you should go out and buy a bunch of giant stuff because yes, it would be a whole other problem if you had too many big pieces of furniture crammed into a tight space, especially if there are no small pieces to break it up visually. But I don't often see people with this problem. The two problems I just mentioned earlier are much more common. The solution is to properly measure your room and decide on a furniture layout and elevations that work for your space, which you can learn more about in our instructional video series. This can help you to avoid having too many empty spots and too many spots where you have something like a bedside table that's far too small in relation to the bed and to the available space you have. Or avoid having something like a little four foot by six foot rug under a coffee table when what you really need is a 10 foot by 14 foot rug to go under the whole seating area, including the sofa and chairs. For example, taking a little side table that is 18 inches in diameter and 18 inches high with spindly metal legs and a glass top and replacing it with a side table that is 30 inches in diameter and 30 inches high made out of substantial wood and then putting a substantial lamp on it can make a whole sofa arrangement look so much better. We created several example drawings for our resources section because this can be a tricky thing to visualize and it's helpful to have a reference guide. Number nine, learn how to properly place art. This can be one of the hardest things for people, but it's one of the most important secret weapons to make your rooms feel finished and one of the best ways to add in your own design ideas and personality. My top tip is to avoid hanging one small piece of art all by itself, way up high on a wall, and then repeating that formula on every wall. Instead, choose single pieces that are large in scale or hang a series of smaller pieces together in a grouping to take up a larger amount of space. Hang them so that the bottom of the single piece or the grouping is close to the piece of furniture it's over and not closer to the ceiling. You probably need to go larger and lower than you think. When I go into a consultation with new clients, one of the first things I do is to consolidate small pieces of art into tighter groupings, such as two smaller pieces stacked vertically in a narrow space, like between two doors or two windows. This is especially important if there's no furniture underneath the art. You may be wondering, what kind of art should I buy? And my honest answer is, what makes you happy to look at? You don't need to buy expensive things and you don't need to know about art. If it fills up your walls the right way and adds to your overall design, it doesn't have to be precious or exclusive to be a good fit for your home. The lessons in our video series explain how to find art and how to get an interesting mix of styles, sizes, types of groupings, and placement ideas. Number 10, complete your project. This may seem like an obvious one, but I find a lot of people start a project on their own, then get to a point where they know something's off and they're not sure what that is. Here's what's often missing, the last layer of styling. Don't overlook the importance of these three things in particular. Small stacks of coffee table books, which can be excellent styling tools that add personality, texture, and color to so many types of tabletops and are not very difficult to style well. Large table lamps. Even if you have plenty of overhead lighting, these can add a really nice layer of height and a sense of completion. And plants. They're such a great way to add life to a room, whether it's something small as part of a tabletop grouping or a lush seven foot tall tree to fill in an empty corner or some of both. If you feel like you don't know what you're doing, simply buying some major pieces of furniture and picking paint colors can be so exhausting that you're burnt out by the time you're done with that and you've run out of steam for finishing the rest. Yes, it's very important to get those main foundational building block pieces right, but how many times have you heard, 
it's all in the details. Adding layers of accessories and smaller occasional furniture is just as important as the bigger pieces, even if you appreciate a fairly minimalist and modern look. So try to stay focused and don't stop short of this step. Even if they seem like things you may not need in terms of functionality, they can be important to give the space character and richness and to make it feel warm, comfortable, and pulled together from a visual standpoint. The right accessories can really make or break the whole thing. Be sure to budget your energy and money for this step. Okay, that's my list of some of the main issues you may face in designing your home along with some specifics about building a foundation of knowledge to overcome them. My goal is to give you more in-depth guidance beyond. Here's a quick list of what to do or what not to do. I've assembled a great team and we've created a complete series of short videos, including downloadable documents to teach you the process of how to tackle your interior design puzzle because it's much easier to reach your destination when you have a clear roadmap to follow. What makes this course unique is that it's organized in a comprehensive format and it focuses on the essentials of home decor without including other types of lifestyle content. There are so many interrelated elements that go into a good design, so the process can be very fluid and you may end up with overlapping steps. That's normal for a designer too, but design can be a frustrating process for people whose brain works in a more linear fashion. Our series will give you both the essential and specific details, such as how to style a coffee table and how to get the right size rug, but also give you a solid overview of the structure and outline of a project from start to finish, which is what will help to take a lot of the guesswork out of it for you. In addition to using photos from my own design portfolio as instructional examples, we discuss how and where to find the best inspirational photos that are right for you. The lessons are about how to take the design ideas in those photos or your own creative ideas and turn them into reality in your own home. The videos can be watched all at once or one by one over time as you chip away at your design. You can rewatch as often as you need to as your project progresses. At the end, you'll have an action plan so you can get to work on your project and start crossing things off your list with confidence. We designed this to address as many questions as possible, but of course, every living space has its own unique opportunities and challenges. Sometimes it's helpful to get personalized suggestions and a second opinion on your specific project. If you find that you still have questions about any aspect of designing your home and would like to work with us one-on-one -on -one via live video chat, we schedule sessions in half hour time blocks. There are no dumb questions here and no detail too small for us to tackle with you. We charge by the half hour and you can sign up and choose a meeting time with one of the designers on our team so you can show us your rooms in real time. Please visit our website where you can find more information about purchasing our complete video series or purchasing a one-on-one -on -one video consultation or both. Thanks so much for watching and I so look forward to helping you on your interior design journey.